Hey guys, welcome back to our reading of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. When we last left off, we were in the middle of chapter one, and Dumbledore and McGonagall were about to meet Hagrid, who has brought Harry Potter with him on his motorcycle, which just fell out of the sky in front of them. If the motorcycle was huge, it was nothing to the man sitting astride it. He was almost twice as tall as a normal man, and at least five times as wide. He looks simply too big to be allowed, and so wild. Long tangles of bushy black hair and beard hid most of his face. He had hands the size of trash can lids, and his feet in their leather boots were like baby dolphins. In his vast, muscular arms, he was holding a bundle of blankets. Hagrid, said Dumbledore, sounding relieved. At last! Where did you get that motorcycle? Borrowed it, Professor Dumbledore, sir, said the giant, climbing carefully off the motorcycle as he spoke. Young Sirius Black lent it to me. I've got him, sir. No problems, were there? No, sir. House was almost destroyed, but I got him out all right before the muggles started swarming around. He fell asleep as we was flying over Bristol. Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall bent forward over the bundle of blankets. Inside, just visible, was a baby boy, fast asleep. Under a tuft of jet black hair over his forehead, they could see a curiously shaped cut like a bolt of lightning. Is that where? whispered Professor McGonagall. Yes, said Dumbledore. He'll have that scar forever. Couldn't you do something about it, Dumbledore? Even if I could, I wouldn't. Scars can come in handy. I have one myself above my left knee that is a perfect map of the London Underground. Well, give him here, Hagrid. We'd better get this over with. Dumbledore took Harry in his arms and turned toward the Dursley's house. Could I... Could I say goodbye to him, sir? Asked Hagrid. He bent his great shaggy head over Harry, and gave him what must have been a very scratchy, whiskery kiss. Then, suddenly, Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. <laughs> Shh, said McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. <laughs> Sorry, sobbed Hagrid, taking out a large spotted handkerchief and burying his face in it. But I, I can't stand it. <laughs> Lily and James dead, and poor little Harry off to live with muggles. Yes, yes, it's all very sad, but get a grip on yourself, Hagrid, or we'll be found, Professor McGonagall whispered, patting Hagrid gingerly on the arm as Dumbledore stepped over the low garden wall and walked to the front door. He laid Harry gently on the doorstep, took a letter out of his cloak, tucked it inside Harry's blankets, and then came back to the other two. For a full minute, the three of them stood and looked at the little bundle. Hagrid's shoulders shook. Professor McGonagall blinked furiously, and the twinkling light that usually shone from Dumbledore's eyes seemed to have gone out. Well, said Dumbledore finally, what's that? We've no business staying here. We may as well go and join in the celebrations. Yeah, said Hagrid in a very muffled voice. I'd best get this bike away. Good night, McGonagall. Professor Dumbledore, sir. Wiping his streaming eyes on his jacket sleeve, Hagrid swung himself onto the motorcycle and kicked the engine into life. With a roar, it rose into the air and off into the night. I shall see you soon, I expect, Professor McGonagall, said Dumbledore, nodding to her. Professor McGonagall blew her nose in reply. Dumbledore turned and walked back down the street. On the corner, he stopped and took out the silver put-outer. He clicked it once and twelve balls of light sped back to their street lamps, so the privet drive glowed suddenly orange, and he could make out a tabby cat slinking around the corner at the other end of the street. He could just see the bundle of blankets on the step of number four. Good luck, Harry, he murmured. He turned on his heel, and with a swish of his cloak, he was gone. A breeze ruffled the neat hedges of privet drive, which lay silent and tidy under the inky sky, the very last place you would expect an astonishing thing to happen. Harry Potter rolled over inside his blankets without waking up. One small hand closed on the litter beside him, and he slept on, not knowing he was special, not knowing he was famous, not knowing he would be woken a few hours' time by Mrs. Dursley's scream as she opened the front door to put out the milk bottles, nor that he would spend the next few weeks being prodded and pinched by his cousin Dudley. He couldn't know that at this very moment, people meeting in secret places all over the country were holding up their glasses and saying in hushed voices, To Harry Potter, the boy who lived.